Yeah, I think I'm the first one of three um, blockchain slash uh, Bitcoin presentations. So um, I decided to go a slightly different route and really focus on the on the topic of money and, and try to show you a little bit about the, the history and, and the issues at hand that, um, to, to maybe really answer the question about the why. Why is the... Why is the blockchain or the, the, the decentralized uh, ledger technology such a such a hype topic? Um, and just as a small disclaimer, I think most of the numbers will be U.S. Uh, just because it's like big, and uh, the a lot of the books and stuff that I read had like um, connotation from the Austrian school of economics. Uh, you, you might <laughs> realize that in the presentation. Um, okay. So, what is money? Who of you knows what money is? That's the uh, usually in the in the economics class we learned about this three three uh, functions of money. Okay, you can use it uh, for exchange, makes barter easier. You can use it as a unit of account to compare uh, apples and bananas, and uh, you can store value with it over time. So then, how did we come up with today's money? Uh, because the, the type of money that we have today is kind of like a very specific form of money, and it has not always been like that. So just again, um, very quick, at the beginning, we had like commodity money. You can think of a gold coin. This means the money itself contains the value. Then you have a representative money. You can think of a gold certificate. This means somewhere in the world, there is still some value. But uh, because it's too difficult to, to carry it around, you only have a piece of paper that confirms that you own this gold in the world. And uh, from that, you had like fractional forms of representative money, so one-third of the value is stored in gold. And then we end up with fiat money, uh, the particular type of money that we have today that is not backed uh, by anything uh, except maybe your government telling you to pay the taxes in it to, to make it a legal tender. I'll come to that point later, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll come to that point. Um, and there is a special link uh, between war and the type of money that we have today. And I think it's uh, very, very important to understand this link. So I'll spend a little bit of uh, time on, on the history of it. Um, prior to, to World War I, there was still a, a gold standard in place where really the, the money you had had some real value. And then, as, as always did, I mean, I started rather late. You can look at the history of war and money by going much, much more back in time. Uh, whenever there's war, governments need more money to buy weapons and uh, fight a war. Uh, so it's uh, very handy for them if they can just print the money. So... Whenever there's a war, usually these hard currencies uh, don't, don't persist it. So the same happened in, in the First World War. And then afterwards, you have this phase where all this money that got printed during the war uh, leads to, a, to inflation, and you had reparations and everything, and basically uh, the currency crashes. And then you have some form of coming back again. You try, and you come back to this gold standard, and only a partitional gold standard. And again, in between here, there is the Vietnam War. So the government spends more money than it has backed by gold. And the ratio is not, not fitting anymore. And people try to speculate against it. And then 1971, the last time we had like a money that properly was backed by, by some, some gold, um, broke and uh, the Bretton Woods uh, regime ended. And uh, ever after, we only had the, the fiat currency regime. 
and I'll show some graphs afterwards where we can look at this number and, and see how, how the um, developments took off afterwards. So, <clears throat> next question again, who of you knows how money gets created? Okay. Um, that's the cool thing about fiat currency. Uh, it's like that. You know, there's nothing behind it. You just create it out of thin air. The, the, the central banks do it. And then they give this money to the normal banks. And the normal banks uh, do something uh, funny, which is called the fractional reserve banking, which means they get some, they get some cash, but they only have to uh, keep a small amount of it. And then they create a loan. So they themselves, again, create money out of thin air, nothing backed, uh, and they give it out to somebody. And this somebody probably is bringing it back to a bank again. And the same thing happens again. The bank saves here 10%. Before Basel III, it was even lower. And then the money gets loaded out. New money gets created. So you have like a multiplier at the end that from this initial $1,000, uh, you would have like $10,000 in the, in the, or about $10,000 in the, in the economy circulating. So the first initial 1000 got like created out of thin air from the central bank, and the other 9000 get created out of thin air from the banks. And of course, they charge interest and earn a lot of money with that. So this type of currency, uh, I think... There has never been, in history, there has never been a, a period of time where we only had fiat currencies. This is really like this 1971, it's the first time uh, where we really, as a global society, changed to this form of money. And it has some problems. <laughs> so, this is the amount of money, uh, M2. Uh, and if you look at the, the graph, this is 1971, and they had to give up the gold standard because the difference between this point and this point was too much for the currency to hold. And you can see after the, after the, the gold standard drop, you can, you can see it, it changed quite dramatically. Just, just in relation, it, 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 it's pretty mind-boggling, I think. And this is inflation, you know, like uh, whenever there's <laughs> excess money printed, this is like a secret tax. So, uh, all you. <laughs> and um, the, the, of course, I mean, another part is with the, with the inflation and the interest, um, certain people profit from that. <laughs> the people that own the money, that own the banks, uh, this is usually like the top 10% or something, they have a positive income from, from inflation and from, from interest, and then you have like the rest who is basically losing out. So it's really like a, a, a shift from wealth and money from the bottom to the top, just through the, through the system. Okay, there's a second issue, uh, that's the debt. Uh, governments really... Uh, like to spend money, and the easiest way to spend the money is um, by keeping the taxes as they are and uh, just get a loan to spend money. And with this fiat type of currency, it's really easy for governments to get new money because the banks just create it, the central banks just create it, and there you have it. And you can see they uh, make use of that. And especially this is like... Um, very interesting point here that you, you might recognize the financial crisis of 2007 where you see um, all of a sudden <laughs> they borrow a lot of money uh, to again bail out the banks. And then, of course, the fiat currencies are very unstable. I mean, there's nothing, they're not anchored to anything. There's uh, it, it, all the, the, you saw like the, the amount of money really increases this one uh, here, it, it, it goes through the roof. And the money has to go somewhere. You notice, if you, if you look at this line, 
this is the real economy, you know? Uh, the real economy, I mean, it's growing, but it's not like, um, you see, this is the index of real economy. So if this was one and this is five, okay, the economy grew maybe to three times the real economy. But in all of these years, all the money that we created had to go somewhere. So you, you have like uh, foreign exchange currencies. You, you buy like pounds or, or Swiss francs or you buy currencies. And the interesting thing you see here, already the currencies have five times the amount of the real economy. And then you go here and you see, okay, we can have uh, stocks and deriv like stock derivatives and, and futures. And this is all this funky new financial instruments, uh, which basically is like not related to anything real, but just bets on bets on digital bets and future bets. And, and all that stuff goes up to like 40 times the real economy. It's like really the, like the, the, People in London and probably in Zurich and in Frankfurt and Singapore, they're really shuffling around a lot of digital money all the time. And the, the point is the governments are really dependent on these funds. You can, you can imagine if, if, if this money that is part of the, the gambling market is like five times your yearly budget and they just withdraw half of it to punish you like in Greece or something, uh, you have a problem because you as government can, cannot do anything anymore if the financial markets rule where the money goes. And I think, and here you see, that, that's really funny, like 2008 again, you know? You, you think, well, 2008 was really bad, you know? We had a proper recession. But that, that's the real economy, we had like a small dip. <laughs> but within the financial world, which is not linked to anything real. You have like this huge, this huge dip. Okay. And there are like uh, two other uh, topics that I only want to mention briefly, and I think it's really worth uh, going to the internet and doing some, some research on your own. Um, first, uh, Professor Helbing already mentioned the, the dollar today, it's it's half officially backed by oil. So Saudi Arabia uh, only sells its oil for dollar and um, all the other countries are kindly asked uh, to, do, to do it the same way. And uh, it's usually not a good idea to deviate from that, from that demand. And, but, but you see here, Alan Greenspan, he's, he was the, the former, bank, uh, former head of the Central Bank of, of America. He, he openly, in his autobiography, admitted, you know, the Iraq, the Iraq war was largely about oil. So the, the cost you pay for having the, 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 the dollar linked to the oil, uh, you, you pay usually in, in wars. And I, I mean, the, the Iraq and the uh, Afghanistan war, I think there's estimates that stuff costed between three trillion and six trillion or something. This is just the the, the money they spend on war because they, they try to maintain the, um, the dollar and, and oil link. And another very interesting point is with this anchor currency. Uh, I, I mentioned the Bretton Woods Treaty before. The Bretton, before the, the um, First World War, the, the British pound really was like the leading anchor currency of the, of the globe because of the Commonwealth. And then through the Bretton Woods uh, system, the, the anchor currency switched to the, to the US dollar. And having the anchor currency gives you a lot of advantages as a country. Because basically all the oil is tr traded in dollar and all the um, reserves of foreign countries are held in, in dollar. Um, there is a huge amount of money that is outside that needs to be invested somewhere. So they need to invest it mostly in the US and you get like cheap investments. And the other thing is you have this neat thing called signorage where whenever you still inflate and you saw the graph, I mean, they're inflating heavily. It's kind of like not only taxing your own people, this secret massive tax, but you're taxing like the rest of the world who has to keep your money to buy the oil. So... 
again, if you look at what they spend on wars, then you learn how they do it is partly by making everybody on the globe who holds dollar make pay for it. Okay, but um, the, the presentation is about Bitcoin, right? So uh, two solutions, uh, the two Austrian school solutions. The first one is returning to the gold standard, um, very old school, and uh, in all the Swiss uh, citizens have the chance to, to vote for that on the 10th of June and, and check out the website. And then um, this goes back to Ludwig von Mises. And then there is the idea of the denationalization of money. Basically having um, private entities create currencies that then compete against each other. Like there's this idea of why should the state have a monopoly uh, over the money? Why, why shouldn't we treat money as any other good where we say, look, um, we have some competition amongst different currencies and then the best currency will win. The best currency, uh, the best currency system. So, <clears throat> and my, my thesis and I'm the, the, a couple of people who have written books about it say the same, that this is really the revolutionary point about the cryptocurrencies. What you see happening now, I mean, you can look up like how many new currencies pop up every month and, and how many ICOs there are. And there's really the first time uh, a, a truly a market for currencies where new experiments get started, where you have um, people really trying out different things and, and competing uh, within this realm of, of currencies. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I cannot spend uh, the time to really explain you how cryptocurrencies work, but there is this uh, amazing video from uh, Three Blue, One Brown. Uh, it, it's like a math teacher, and it's like the perfect video to understand it. It's 20 minutes. Uh, have a watch. And just like a quick example of one of the cryptocurrencies, if you look at Bitcoin, it has this gold... Um, capability you know it, it 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 is it is capped there will only ever be 21 million of bitcoins so there will be no inflation you know, the, the, one of the problems is solved with this one currency and it's it's decentralized so you don't need banks and you don't need governments and you saw like this this unholy coalition of banks and governments uh increasing the money amount and fighting wars and stuff uh it's kind of neat I mean, they're, they're cut out now. So, um, but I want to really, really stress this is only like one of the currencies, you know, and it's competing against all the other currencies. And maybe we can design currencies that have even better properties. And, and, and we, we, we enhance this list, you know, and we make it like sustainable and, and whatnot. You know, it's, it's really, don't, don't focus too much on this, this one currency, but really understand the paradigm shift coming from this fiat currency to the first time having like an environment where people really compete about money. And of course, uh, the quick check, is it really money? It's liquid, you know, you, you can do transfers. Uh, it's encrypted, so you have the, the store of value as long as uh, you don't lose the key. And it's divisible, you know, it's even much smaller divisible because it's digital than, than normal coins. So yeah, it is money. And of course, um, there's a lot of open questions. Um, how anonymous are the transactions? And again, there's coins who solve this problem better than others. How scalable is it? Like, uh, probably everybody of you has heard, you know, um, scaling issues or is using a lot of energy. There's surely, uh, there's surely issues. But again, that's the idea of having a marketplace. A marketplace means different actors compete for the best solution. So I'm pretty confident that, that we will solve these issues along, along the way. And I hope uh, I make you interested in some discussion. <laughs>